Hey, hey, you see this guy here? This guy? Me? Yeah, this guy's a loser. What the heck, man? Oh, whoops. Sorry, I was reading the wrong script. Yeah, the wrong script. Uh, this guy is a gamer. Yeah, maybe. And what a great time it is to be a gamer. The cost of entry is getting lower and lower, and really all you need anymore is just a basic smartphone and a controller, and you can stream AAA games. In fact, this whole idea of handhelds seems to be becoming more and more popular. Sure, back in the day, we had Game Boys, but now we have things like the Retroid Pocket, which is an inexpensive device that can emulate old video games, or even straight up the Nintendo Switch, which is its own dedicated console with a whole catalog of games. We even are starting to get full-blown gaming computers in the palm of your hands, things like the Steam Deck or the Asus ROG Ally. And to me, that's the coolest thing, bringing the full-blown power of PC gaming to your hands. I feel like it's really just as simple as putting laptop hardware in a gaming form factor. And I think it's something that I could even make on my own. In fact, it's something I have actually tried to make before. This is a gaming portable handheld I made about nine years ago based on the Raspberry Pi 3. Back in the day, the Raspberry Pi 3 was a pretty cool emulation device. So this was based around emulation. It could handle most Nintendo 64 games and below, but this thing's kind of a unergonomic mess. It's very blocky doesn't have a very good design. I'm not even sure it powers on anymore. Uh, it's cool, but with what I know now, I know I can do much better. And so in the back of my mind, I've had this great idea for a portable gaming handheld, but I haven't been able to act upon it. That is until recently. I've known about this company called Framework for a while. And what Framework does is make very modular laptops in the sense that they want their laptops to be as user repairable as possible. This means though, they sell bits and components of their laptop and you can straight up buy a motherboard for a framework laptop that has typical laptop hardware in it. They are fairly expensive, but recently I found their 11th gen i7 board on sale for $300. So I went ahead and bought it and this project was born. Now, before I start covering the actual physical design of the device, I need to talk about some of the requirements and problems that come with a gaming handheld. The first major one is the power of the device. How do you power it? Uh, with this original device, I actually use an off-the-shelf battery pack. That's what this big lump is in here and just connected it to one of the USB ports internally. I soldered the wires. But for this device, because I'm basing it off the framework laptop, what I did is I just bought a framework battery. <laughs> this is actually the bigger battery. Uh, hopefully this will give me the most battery life as possible in my gaming handheld. The next issue was the screen. Framework has a dedicated connector for a screen, but I, don't, I can't really use that. So I'm gonna be using a type C to HDMI adapter uh, paired with the eight inch wave share display. This is gonna be my screen for the device. Maybe if you look up the specs, you'll know that this is actually a bigger screen than what's offered on the Steam Deck, the Asus device, or even the Nintendo Switch. Eight inches, about an inch bigger than those ones. Uh, this company, Waveshare, does also make a nine inch screen, which very much interested me for this project, but it is a little bit too large. Uh, but maybe I can find a way to fit it in there for a future iteration of the project. Now this last part is definitely the hardest thing to solve. I want to make my own controls for the device. Uh, if you look up Framework Handheld, it has been done before, but they use off the shelf controllers. I wanna make my own. I wanna be able to customize the joysticks. I wanna use Hall Effect joysticks. And I wanna be able to customize the feel of all of my buttons. So it's important for me to be able to design my own. Now, the easiest way to do it realistically is if I could cut an uh, Xbox 360 controller in half and just staple it to the sides and use that, that's a pretty ergonomic controller that would work great. But that's not really feasible, at least easily, cutting a PCB in half like that. So that's when I actually found out about this thing called GP2040CE. And what that is, is it's open source firmware that goes on a Raspberry Pi 
Pico or an RP2040 microprocessor. I'm actually gonna be using this WaveShare branded RP2040 microprocessor. And when you flash the firmware on this, when you plug it into a computer, it shows up as an Xbox 360 controller, which would mean any controller I set up with this will be able to work on just about any game that has controller support. And that's awesome. Along with this, I am gonna be using Hall Effect joysticks, and I'm going to be using low profile Gateron key switches. There are three kinds of these. There is a linear, a clicky, and a tactile. And by combining them in specific ways, I'm gonna be able to fully customize the feel of my controller. It also means if anyone wants to recreate my project, they can even switch around what I did. They don't have to use the same layout. They can customize the feel of each button which I think is really cool. Nevertheless, GP2040CE is a super capable firmware and honestly, it's overkill for this project. I feel like it deserves a video of its own. So let me know in the comments below if you wanna learn more about that and maybe I can make a dedicated video. With all of that settled, I was ready to start designing the case for the thing. What I first found was a tablet that someone had made with the framework motherboard and I went ahead and yoinked that. What I also did was take pictures of my favorite controller uh, bring it into Fusion 360, use the, the, my pictures as a canvas, and using the form tool, recreated the general shape of the controller. Uh, eventually, I decided I did not like that, and I yoinked an Xbox 360 controller model. I did edit the model heavily, stretch it out, things like that, to make it fit into my design. And then from there, it was time to start printing test pieces. So I printed tons and tons of these sorts of pieces with different grip designs that would both allow enough space to connect things to the motherboard, but also feel comfortable to hold. So it was, took a lot of iterations until I settled on something more like this. You can see this is actually mocked up already with the joystick and buttons, but it feels pretty comfortable to hold and has enough space internally for the motherboard to connect. I then printed a fuller size case. This is not actually complete, but just to be able to mock up everything and double check all the spacing and stuff. I knew this was gonna be really hard to fit everything inside of the case, but with this mocked up, this feels pretty comfortable in the hand. As you can tell, it is very large. Uh, the motherboard isn't small, especially the battery itself is even longer. Accommodating for everything makes this device pretty big. That's actually part of the reason I went with the eight inch screen over something like a seven inch screen. In this video, I printed out a more updated case. So we're gonna go ahead and mock everything up. This case is printed in PLA, so this is going to be a mock-up. We will boot the device here at the end and double check everything, but I will follow up in, a, in another video where I print the case out of ABS and do a final walkthrough of the whole project. But stick around in this video and we're gonna go ahead and go through the build process and we can see and feel how this thing is going to be. So yeah, let's get going. So this here is the brains behind the whole operation. This is the framework motherboard, the 11th gen. All of their motherboards actually look the same size. So this project could be recreated with any of their other motherboards, but something to maybe put in perspective is how big this is. This is a Nintendo Switch. The whole motherboard is about the same size as a Nintendo Switch. So maybe you can see why I went with an eight inch screen. This thing is very big. Additionally, the framework motherboard or the framework battery is just a bit longer, sticks out from the side. So actually getting this into a handheld form isn't really the easiest. So that's why you'll see why this handheld is so big. But to me, I'm cool with it. I dislike how small the screen is on the Switch. I want it to be bigger. So with this project, it can use a much bigger screen. All right, so let's get into the case. The case itself is three major pieces. There's the back case, this middle part, which holds the battery, and then the top case, which holds the controls. Basically, this whole thing is held together with a bunch of different heat set inserts. So the first thing I'm gonna do for building this is gonna put in the heat set inserts for the motherboard and install the motherboard with the battery sled. So I'll get going on that. To be able to access the actual charging, uh, and just one of the USB ports on the device. I got this right, or this 90 degree little adapter that does support the full 100 watts through it. And what I did is make sure you pre-install it first because there's like a little slot that'll help support it right here in the side of the case. So when this sticks in here, you'll see it lines up perfectly. 
And then if you hold the motherboard in place, you'll have a bit of space to access that port. It is a little further back in the case. Uh, cables will still reach it, but things like USB drives or like dongles or something, you may need to get like a little extender. All right, now here's one of the, the goofier parts of this. These are, I believe, 10 millimeter M3 screws that I'm using, but in the, the idea of trying to make everything as printable as possible, I wanted to print this as one flat piece. I didn't want a little nub sticking off the back. So I 3D printed separate little standoffs that are gonna go on each screw. A little bit of a pain to line it all up, but it isn't too difficult, I found. Some of the keen eyed among you might recognize this as a Linus Tech Tip screwdriver. And something fun to mention is Linus himself owns a part of Framework Laptops, the company that actually is, is making this motherboard. He's an investor with them. And in true Linus fashion, when I first mocked everything up, I did play Crab Rave over the speakers. Everything's cinched down. You'll see that everything is installed. There's the motherboard. There's some room for the fan to breathe. And the battery will go in here, but we'll do that part later. And now I'm actually gonna move to the top case. All right, the front case actually has a lot of heat set inserts. There's all the ones that are gonna hold the controls in place. And then there's all the ones that are gonna hold the back case to the front case. So I will get going on that. So that is a lot of heat set inserts, but I'm trying to make the controls actually be as strong and stiff as possible. And then you need to be able to attach the front to the back, of course. There was one heat set insert I skipped, which I will put in in a moment. And that is actually this one here. This is where the little Wi-Fi chip will attach to this tiny little thing here. Uh, if you want, you know, your computer to have Wi-Fi, you probably want the Wi-Fi chip. There's an antenna that goes with this as well. I'm gonna talk about how I figured to mount all of the controls. The way I'm doing it is with this little piece here. The Gateron low profile key switches will snap into place and then the, the joystick actually sticks in here pretty well, um, but then there is a spot where you can fold over the tabs on the back to hold it in place. However, I have some bad news when it comes to mocking this up right now. Uh, these joysticks that I bought, these are Hall Effect joysticks. Uh, this one is completely dead. It just doesn't work. The other one, I was testing this all last night. So the other one, it does work only on one axis. This axis, when I tested it, when I started wires to it, it just didn't work. So this only works one way. So for mocking it up today, I'm only going to be able to hook up all of the buttons. I'm not going to bother with the joysticks, unfortunately. But I will show you kind of what it looks like when it's mounted in place because I incorporated something that I think is pretty cool. So with this thing in place, I designed these cool sort of add-ons. Typically you would put just a circle around a joystick to make it move in a circular fashion. And that lines up and screws in, it's threaded. So if you notice the knurling on the side here of what goes around the joystick, uh, it's for this tool actually to stick on that you can actually remove this and the reason I did this is I plan on doing a lot of emulation the joystick on the Nintendo 64 and the GameCube uses a like octagonal pattern so if you see I, I, I made this one so when you move it around it it kind of locks in on those octagon features it took me a lot of tries to actually get one that lined up correctly when it's all the way tightened if you see that's pretty perfect and the joystick will be able to click, click into place and then if you want to play a different game you can unscrew it and then put back the circular one. So I think it's a cool feature here. Anyway, we're gonna add on these. I'm gonna put in all the switches and we'll mount it to here. So I'm a bit of a fanboy actually of the linears. You would imagine that on like the regular buttons, you may wanna use the tactile switches, but I'm, I really like the, the feel of the linear. So I'm gonna use linears for, this is gonna be the D-pad and I'm also gonna use it for all four buttons, A, B, X, Y. So see, it just clicks into place. You just make sure it lines up right with the little holes. Push it through, clicks into place, and it locks in pretty good. So you don't actually need any glue or anything to hold them in. You'll see the pins stick out, so we'll be able to solder to them pretty easily. We'll probably melt the PLA a little bit, but that's no big deal. And then I'm going to use the tactile actually for, this is gonna be select, and then that bottom button is gonna be the capture button if we're doing like Nintendo Switch emulation. For the trigger and bumper, I have these little add-on boards that have some angle to them. There's really not a lot of room to fit in the trigger and bumper. It was something I struggled with a lot. 
but what I devised I think will work pretty well. How this is gonna work is this gonna mount on the back here and we'll, we'll line up with one of the screw holes. And I'm gonna use a clicky switch for the bumper and a red switch for the trigger. There is unfortunately no analog triggers on this. Maybe that's something I can do in a revised version. I would love to do analog triggers, but there just really wasn't room. And there also wasn't any more analog pins on the WaveShare. So gonna do this. I'm gonna go ahead and install that here. So pretty easy, easy to install. The buttons can be installed afterwards. So we're just gonna screw it in. I'm using six millimeter M3 screws. You'll notice that some of these are countersunk and some of them are not. That is because of the battery in the case. I don't want screw heads anywhere near the battery. There is enough space according to my 3D model, but it still made me uncomfortable. I don't want a piece of metal touching like a lithium pack that doesn't have any sort of like protection around it. So I countersunk these screws to just keep them away from the battery pack. And then for the last screw, I'm actually going to use an eight millimeter long screw so that it can go through both the little piece that holds on the trigger and bumper. So you'll see there's actually something in there that holds this in place. And then in the back case, there's actually gonna be something that rests against the very bottom edge here. So again, the screw is just to kind of keep it lined up. Yeah, you'll see how that works. There's the D-pad, there's these. So. For the actual buttons, I would of course recommend SLA printing them, which I am getting done by a future sponsor. Stick around to find out who they are. But it is totally possible to FDM 3D print the buttons themselves. Uh, I do recommend printing them at a 45 degree on one of the chamfers, and that'll help give you the most strength because it'll make those layer lines diagonal um, and kind of give you some of the best fidelity. But you will have to do some post-processing. You'll see these are a little rough and I haven't actually done any post-processing, but they'll just slide in and line up. You may need to clean up some of the edges with something like a knife or a file. All right, so same thing on the other side. I already have all the switches installed on this one. Go ahead and put it in there and screw everything down. All right, so just for fun, let's wire up one of these buttons and check it working with uh, the computer and showing up as an Xbox 360 controller. I'll just grab what I was working on before. We'll keep the one axis of this joystick working and I'll wire up, let's do this button here. You can see I, I put in one of the FDM 3D printed buttons here. So you may be thinking to yourself, hey, Tommy B, why didn't you just design a PCB that could screw in right here? Well, you would be correct in thinking that. I should have. I don't know, in my mind I was thinking like, oh, I want this to be as recreatable as possible if anyone else wants to make it. And I felt like custom circuit boards was maybe not the way to go. Um, but they would have made this all much easier. There should still be enough room to install everything with the wires, as long as you're very neat and you use very thin gauge wires like these ones are. So it should be fine, but it, yeah, I maybe should have just gone the PCB route. There's no reason for these to exist. Nevertheless, let's check this out. So you can see there, I press the button. It lights up on the gamepad tester. If I move the joystick, you'll see I can move you know, only one axis of the one joystick. But there you go, it's working and it shows up as an Xbox controller, which is exactly what I wanted. All right, I actually had to rewind for a minute and remove the battery sled piece uh, because there's an important part I actually forgot about. And that is that I need to be able to turn the device on. There is a switch on the motherboard right here, this tiny little thing that does allow you to turn it on by clicking it. In. But of course, I don't have access to that from the outside. So I'm going to do something kind of sacrilegious. I'm going to solder wires to either side of that switch. I do know, and I did find out after I had planned this whole thing, that through this port down here, you can get a little aftermarket like plug-in thing that this guy makes that would let you have access to a, the power buttons. So you could just solder straight to that little add-on board, which I, again, Maybe I'll look into for a future revision of the project, but for now, I'm gonna do something a little horrific, but I will be very careful about it. I promise. All right, well, let's finish putting together what I've got for now. I'll put in the battery as one of the last steps, but I'm gonna pre-hook up a couple of things here. One is gonna be this adapter. I think I'm gonna use for the final version, the actual framework. Type-C to HDMI adapter because it is so small. This is pretty big and long. And I did find that there is a way I can make it fit in the cable channel I put here, but 
for now, we're just gonna use this. I'm gonna hook up another Type-C cable for the touch port. One thing I'm also going to install right now is the speakers, or maybe I won't install them, but at least check their placement. These are just the off-the-shelf framework speakers, and the way they're going to fit in here is down in here, there's these two little standoffs, and then there's gonna be a screw that comes in from underneath to hold it in place. You know, I think in the actual final build, they're gonna be easiest to install before I install the motherboard because now I have no way really of getting in there to put the nut on. But their placement is pretty perfect. They fit in there and then this is just long enough for me to plug it right into the corner there. So perfect, that is good, we want that. Now I'm actually gonna slot the screen into place. I have already test fit this a little bit before and it is just a slight bit small. I can still get it in place, but it is really, really tight, which is not what I want. So I have already adjusted the 3D model, so the final case will have a little more screen, a little more space for the screen to go. Yeah, you'll see it's it can't quite sit flush. It's just a little too tight in there. Look at that. That is awesome. I really like that. Well, let's at least hook it up. Let's hook up the battery, hook up the screen, get everything situated and see if it boots all together like that. The battery is already charged. So as soon as that's installed, it should fit. So here's the thing with the framework battery. It can't actually install the normal way because of where the connector is. So it's going to install upside down. However, it has these little captive screws on here. So what I need to do is remove the snap nut that's holding the captive screws on. So I'll do that. All right, well, that was absurdly easy to remove. So I'll just unscrew them and then we're gonna put it in this way and, and screw it in. I'll probably connect it to the um, board first. This is something I need to be very careful about and I'm folding the connector over. So I'm also helping to push this this way. I'm gonna first install it like this. Then we're gonna put the battery in. All right, with the help of some pliers, I was able to do that. This will go in like that. Ooh, you know what? I don't actually like the angle it pulls on it when it's down in that slot. So I think I'm actually gonna move in the final design slot up by this amount. Uh, let me measure that real quick. 4.36, probably call it four and a half, uh, but that'll be a change I make. So it's good that we're doing this. If I can find out these sorts of issues. This is also a good point to check the placement of the speakers, because this is really, yeah. You know what, I mean, that still fits. That does fit. But I really need to rethink the order of how I'm installing this stuff. Because uh, installing this is gonna be a pain in the ass, but maybe I can just glue nuts to here, because the screw's gonna come in from underneath. You yeah, know, that can work, that can work. All right, I have these like sh super slim and short monoprice HDMI cable. So I'll use this here. All right. Now, do we think it's gonna boot? So I brought it over and hooked it back up to the charger. It didn't seem to boot with the battery. I should get a little RGB coloring. There it is. Screen might be upside down, but whatever. But look at that, it is booting. I wonder if the battery is dead or if I potentially damaged it, which I really hope I did not. It says it's charging the battery. Okay, well, let's see if I unplug it then. Look at that, it's working. Let me flip the, <laughs> the screen around though. Look at that, that's awesome. It is booted and working. This isn't complete, obviously. I need to finish the controls, but also this case cannot work. This is PLA. 
I need to reprint it in ABS or another material. I was thinking ABS plus. So I'm gonna tune a really good profile as well as adjust for shrink because ABS likes to shrink and reprint the case and then follow up with another video. One last note, this video turned out to be way too long and I wasn't really expecting that. So I think for the next video, I'm gonna split it into two parts, one overview and benchmarks of the device and then one that's a build log that can serve as a tutorial for anyone trying to recreate it. If you like the video, please subscribe. It does very much help the channel. I'm very close to that 1K mark and that would be awesome if I could hit that. Uh, so thanks for watching.